It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. Today is a special episode. I have an interview with Professor James Choi from Yale University coming up. Professor Choi is a behavioral economist, and he's done some really, really in-depth dive on when you should actually start saving money. And his philosophy is really different than mine. I want you to hear what he has to say. And before that, though, I've got a lot of your questions I'm going to answer. So I'm going to start by answering as many as I can before I do the interview. And I've got a really short update for you. I've talked recently on several occasions about the advantage with cash you have of buying U.S. Treasuries. And I've alluded to what a pain in the rear end it is dealing with treasurydirect.gov to set up accounts to buy treasuries. Treasuries, the way I've described them, they're CDs for rich people. But you don't have to be rich. It's just a more complicated process to buy them. And people have been, uh, to put it uh, mildly, they've been frustrated slash intimidated by the process of buying U.S. Treasuries at TreasuryDirect.gov. And at TreasuryDirect.gov, you can buy ultra-short-term treasuries that are like ultra-short CDs. You don't have a lot of money to buy them. They're just a little complicated. And there are a bunch of different issues of them starting at basically the equivalent of one-month CDs and running from there. Well, I heard enough feedback that this is a bridge too far for most people to think about buying these treasuries. And the idea is it's a great way for you to stash money for a month to a year to buy these as kind of like a savings instrument. You can buy treasuries for up to 30 years, but the idea and where I'd been talking about is buying them for a month to a year, one month, two months, three months, six months, a year. And you only need 100 bucks, but you had all the complexity of buying them. So I was thinking, what's a better way? So if you are the easiest way, if you're with one of the discount brokers, uh, the two big, Schwab and Fidelity, but they're not the only two out there, you can buy from them their own U.S. Treasury money market fund. So there's no risk that the value of your holding will decline because their fixed share price is of a dollar and for every share you buy, and those have been paying rates in the twos. So maybe not as high as what you can do at treasurydirect.gov, depending on the auctions that come up regularly, but you're still able to park your cash earning, depending on where you go to put it, about 2.3 to 2.8% on money in a U.S. Treasury money market fund which is just about the safest place you could ever put money because it's a direct obligation of the federal government. And these require usually very little money to go in. Your money's available to you on typically one day's notice. You can add to it or subtract to it as you wish. And this is an alternative for you to be able to stash cash and earn even more than what typically you can earn in one of the online banks. And by the way, they're typically um, mostly exempt from state. If you live in a state with a state income tax, state that even has a local income tax, you avoid those. You only pay federal tax on your earnings. So Krista, I hope that that gives people an easier path to benefit from the rising rates of U.S. Treasuries. We'll start with Wendy in Ohio's question. I'm starting a new business and would like to add a second phone number for business calls to my existing Android cell phone. 
apparently by signing up for and downloading an app. In reading reviews, there don't seem to be any clear winners in order to accomplish a good business call choice. Do you have any recommendations, please? Works hand in glove with an Android phone is to do Google Voice. I mean, Google Voice has been the go-to for this for a long time. There are a number, though, now of virtual phone services that provide a really sophisticated uh, voicemail for you that will screen all your calls and are subscription-based services. We have not reviewed any of these in forever, so I'm afraid to even mention, but the numbers of those increased a whole lot because of people working remotely during COVID. And we're talking about things that you pay subscriptions in the range of like $10 a month for a basic one where you get a unique phone number and you get all the automated attendant functions that work very well for a small business. And Google Voice does have a business option as well, which gives you more. Than and just, how much is that a month? It starts at 10 a month. Oh, same as I was yeah. talking about. I wonder how they ended up at 10 since so many of these others are at 10 a month. Another question about phone numbers from Nate in Missouri. Hey there, I had a question about your phone number that is purely just for my own curiosity. Being from the St. Louis area, I immediately recognize the area code for the Consumer Action Center, 636, when it's mentioned on air, 636-49-CLARK. What is the story behind this area code usage? Was the CAC originally based near St. Louis or registered there for some reason? I know most of Clark's life was spent in the Atlanta area, so I'm just trying to figure out the St. Louis connection. Well, so the real reason that we have that area code is that's where we could get a vanity number that had Clark in it. So we just hunted around the country till we could find an area code we could get Clark and that's why we have that area code. No particular connection to St. Louis other than I still feel badly about the Rams leaving St. Louis and going back to their former home of Los Angeles. And I was at the Super Bowl in person when St. Louis won the Super Bowl. So I guess that's about it for my connections to St. Louis. Yamuna in Connecticut says, my mortgage recently transitioned to a new servicer and my credit score dropped by almost 20 points after that despite me making all full payments on time and no other changes to the mortgage itself. Is this typical and would the credit bureaus correct if I contacted them? So that should not have happened and that should not be the reason why your score would decline because there was not a new application for credit. I would look at your credit file. This happened to me once where a loan mirrored on my credit file, a mortgage loan, when the servicing was sold. And it showed not one, but two active mortgages for the identical amount of money on my credit file. And I disputed it with the credit bureaus. And two removed it. One would not remove the improper reference. Um, the 20 points, though, should correct over time because the former servicer at some point should, in fact, report properly that you are, that the information they have on you is past, not current, because that's the only thing I can come up with is that mortgage is mirroring and being shown twice. From Joe in Washington, with Hurricane Ian damaging everything it's passed, path, including automobiles, what are the telltale signs consumers can check to see if a used car was in a flood without a mechanic's inspection? Yes, of course, you should get all cars inspected by a mechanic, but if I can look for known signs of flood-damaged cars, I can avoid paying a mechanic hundreds of dollars. So, Joe, you have jumped the gun on us because we were going to wait a few weeks to talk about this in full because the flood cars are a common, and it will be a while till they start showing up in the the used car fleets for sale and a lot of times the vehicles are what are known as wash the titles go through a process some states have tighter title procedures than others 
and uh, underhanded people will move a title of a vehicle that was a flood car to another state, run it through, and suddenly, voila, you have a clean title. Now, Carfax has a process where for free, you don't have to pay, you can do a flood car check, but it will only show up on the Carfax if, in fact, it was a reported insurance claim, which there are times with older used vehicles, they were not insured for collision comprehensive, and therefore, they would not show up as an insured claim. So the long answer is the only way you really know, you run the, the flood report from Carfax as a first step, but if it's an older used vehicle, that won't be enough. You absolutely need the mechanic to check it out to make sure it's okay. And you do not want one of these flood cars no way. I remember when I think it was, I'm trying to remember, it was Hurricane Wilma, which happened in 2005, that uh, caused the destruction of so many vehicles in Texas that massive numbers of those vehicles over the next six months showed up for sale and people ended up buying trouble. And man, did we hear from people over and over again following that hurricane. From John in Washington, my wife recently bought a brand new MacBook Pro 14 inches, but we realize it's only 12.3 inches across. What's up with this? And we realize her old 15 inch one is only 14 inches. So just like with a TV, it's measured diagonally. And my son will tell you, John, that you are past brilliant. He insists that the new MacBook Pro 14 inch is the greatest laptop ever made in the history of humanity. So he would very much appreciate your purchase, but it should be, yeah, um, like any laptop, like the one I'm on here is a 15.6, and if we had a measuring device, we could tell you that the measurement left to right is definitely not 15.6. It is the diagonal angle that would be the 15.6. Pino in Michigan says, I have had an HSA for several years because it's triple tax advantaged. I haven't used it because Clark advises to let it grow and withdraw it tax-free in retirement. However, I've often wondered why not use it for medical expenses now? Say you're in the 35% tax bracket. You've put the money in tax-free and then you're basically saving 35% if you use it now for medical expenses. What am I missing? So you're in uh, just about the highest tax bracket. And so you know there's this embedded very large return you'll get if you use that HSA for unreimbursed medical expenses. And that's the idea. Okay, so why would I have you wait uh, maybe decades more? The idea is that you get the continued tax-free growth of that money. In retirement, as you age in retirement, you're going to have significantly more medical expenses that will come up over time. Being able to pay for those as you age with money that has grown tax-free all through the years will be to your advantage. I understand your point. You're thinking, well, man, in retirement, I'm going to have a lower tax rate than the 35% I have now. And that is possible. And in that case, you would be past dumb listening to me about this because you would have gotten the instant 35% return doing it now. And if you're in a lower tax bracket in retirement, well, not so much. Except generally people who are in higher tax brackets during their working years are also people who've managed to save a lot more money in investments towards retirement and you stay in rarefied tax bracket air in retirement. So if you're making enough money that you're in the 35% tax bracket, odds are that in retirement, you'll be drawing enough money out that you will stay in a higher tax bracket. It's one of those things, though, that is not a gamble. It's a guess, I would say. And if you feel like hey, I'm, odds are very low I'm going to be in a 35% tax bracket way down the road, 
then yes, go ahead and pull the money out. You've already had the wonderful benefits from it and use it to pay those expenses pre-tax. So a lot of these things I'm asked, there are things that are clear, obvious, uh, no doubt answers. And then there's areas that are gray. Coming up, we're going to deal with a lot of gray and different perspectives on gray. Because you'll hear me say things almost like mantras about how you should save money from when you get your first job, the value of compounding over the decades. If you start when you're a teenager, how uh, saving should be a lifelong habit, blah, 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 blah. Well, we're going to hear from Professor James Choi of Yale straight ahead, who is a brilliant behavioral econ economist, say that three times, and he has very different perspectives on what you should be doing than I do, and I think it's really helpful from time to time to hear people who see the same issues, the same set of facts, and come up with a very different answer, and I want you to hear his perspective straight ahead. I have such a pleasure today to have Professor James Choi of Yale University joining me on the podcast because here I've written 10 books on personal finance and I've got lots of competitors that have written books on personal finance. We've got our websites and you know we give advice so many different ways every day to you. And it's like a standard playbook each of us use who talk about personal finance. And then there's this big gulf because economists talk about personal finance completely differently than we do who write and talk and interact with consumers about how to handle their money. Well, in the midst, in the middle of all this is Professor James Choi of Yale who is a behavioral economist, which is an area of economics that takes, kind of bridges the gap between what people would do if we were robots and what humans actually do. And Professor Choi is with me now, and you have done a lot of research on what traditional economists, university-based or just classic economists, would say that we should all do with our money. And then you see what those of us that talk and write about personal finance say. And there's this gulf that is wider than the Red Sea parting between what they would say and what we say that deal with consumers every day. And I thank you so much for joining us here on the Clark Howard podcast. Well, my pleasure. So. You dug deep about different things that we do as humans, the way we approach money. And one of the things that I got a kick about that you've done research is mutual funds. What you found about what consumers actually understand when they buy a fund versus what they should know when they're buying a fund. And I think that's a good illustration of where what people do is not necessarily in their best interest. What did you find out in that area? Well, I mean, I think that a really, really important part of choosing a mutual fund is figuring out what kind of fees that the mutual fund charges. And I think that there are a bunch of people out there that have a mistaken notion that these things are free or that the differences in fees are just uh, not really significant. And actually, there are vast differences in the fees that different mutual funds charge. And in particular, if you're looking at an index fund, so like an S&P 500 index fund, for example, you should be choosing the fund that charges the lowest fees because the portfolio you're being invested in is exactly the same no matter what index fund you're choosing uh, for the S&P 500 uh, index fund universe. And so you, you can basically pay a lot or pay a little for exactly the same product. And what I found was that a lot of people, even very smart, educated, trained people, don't know to look for that lowest fee fund. So I've talked a lot about exactly that, that you wanna buy 
the lowest fees. Uh, you know, historically, the default was saying, you know, this is why you invest with Vanguard. And then more recent years, it's been, you know, ETFs or straight index funds from Fidelity or Schwab get you these very low rates, and this is what you should do. And then I'll get hard pushback from people in the financial services industry who say, I'm missing the mark because the bigger problem is that people left on their own never get around to investing. And so even though they're paying me more for my fees, I'm worth it because I get them to do something they wouldn't do otherwise. Are they right and I'm wrong? Uh, you know, I think there's, there is something to that in that maybe the second best way that you can get yourself into investing and investing is quite important is to pay somebody to help you and to hold your hand and that person couldn't reasonably be asked to work for free and so you have these load mutual funds and no load mutual funds and load mutual funds charge a sales commission up front or on the back end and that goes to compensating that advisor and, and often these loads are, are quite expensive but maybe it's worth it if you know relative to what you would have done without the advisor you wouldn't have you know maybe you're better off paying that extra bit of money now uh, even within the no load category of funds so these are now funds that are being offered without any kind of hand holding there are large differences in the fees that different mutual funds charge so there you really could be paying a lot of money for an S&P 500 index fund that isn't giving you any additional service or hand holding versus uh, an index fund that charges you almost nothing. And there you're really just getting ripped off if you're going with the uh, high fee fund. Well, we jumped right into a form of investing, but I want to go to something that's been central to what you have been talking about and what you've been researching. I, like many other people who work in personal finance, I encourage people to get their kids working really young and to get their kids setting up a Roth IRA when they're a mid-teen, that they get in the habit of investing and they're putting money in there. And I, you know, I call debt a disease and I'm all about building a lifelong habit of investing on the part of kids that it becomes a habit. I'm such a believer in there are good habits we develop and bad habits, but economists, and you talk a lot about this, think that I'm all wet and that other people who are all about getting people from a very young age all focused on investing, that we're missing life, that we're wrong, that that's not what they should be doing. So lay out the economist case and where you found people really do best reside. Yeah, this is a, probably an area that has kind of the most consequential differences between what you know people like you are advising uh, your, your listeners to do versus what economists would say that you should be doing. So economists start with the observation that the fifth slice of pizza that you eat is never as enjoyable as the fourth slice of pizza you eat, which is never as enjoyable as the third slice of pizza you eat, and so on and so forth. And so basically, they're diminishing returns to additional spending on yourself within any given time period. And so if you're thinking about how should I allocate my spending between today and some future period, economists would say, well, rather than really scrimping and scrounging and struggling today and then living over abundantly in the future, you should spend a similar moderate amount in both periods. And so economists call that smoothing out consumption. And so what that means is that if you're in your 20s, you're typically going to have lower income than you would in your 40s. So in your 20s, economists would say, well, you should consume a similar amount to what you would in your 40s. And that means because of your low income in your 20s that you're not doing a lot of saving in your 20s. But then in your 40s, when your income is high, you should really be turning on the savings jets and be kind of a super saver at that point in time to make up for the fact that you didn't save all that much in the 20s. And economists would say that that's kind of the right way to live. Now, there's this other perspective that you so articulately laid out, uh, which is this notion that actually savings is kind of like a habit. It's a discipline that needs to be built up. You become the type of person who saves if you're saving consistently. And that's really a theme that I saw in a lot of these uh, popular personal finance books 
this notion that you need to be a consistent saver over time through thick or thin. So instead of smoothing out your consumption, you should be smoothing out your savings rates. Now, who's right? I think that this is actually an open question. Uh, you know, maybe it really isn't psychologically realistic for economists to think that people can just turn on the savings jets in their 30s and 40s after never having saved before. Uh, and so really they need to be scrimping and scrounging in their 20s to build up that habit so that they can have a reasonable savings rate in their 30s and 40s. I think that's really uh, an interesting question uh, that, that uh, we don't know a lot about as, as uh, research economists, and I'd love to build more evidence on that. Because I'll tell you, I have a lot of people who call me with a case of the guilt and or will talk to me about how, you know, I'm, I'm 42 and I've never saved a penny. And they're like confessing to me like I'm a priest that they're they're feeling so consumed with guilt that here they are, uh, you know, significantly through their working years and they don't have it, two nickels to rub together. And I tell them, let go of the guilt that when you start saving is when you start. And, but there is this mountain they have to climb that I'm curious what you've seen with this because if you do wait till you're 40, the problem is the amount, the percent of your pay you have to save to build up any financial independence and any security in retirement is a giant percent of your pay. Yeah, for sure. So as I said, you need to be a super saver in your 30s and 40s if you haven't saved earlier in life. And there just is kind of a, a grim arithmetic to that. And so, you know, as I said, economists say you should be smoothing out your consumption over time, making it consistent over time. And so that means that in your 40s, under the economist plan, you're not really living much more luxuriously than you were in your 20s. You're kind of consuming a similar amount. And, you know, maybe that would bother uh, people because maybe their friends, their neighbors are living a more luxurious lifestyle in middle age because they did happen to live more frugally in their 20s. And, you know, that's just kind of the trade off that you're making that maybe when you're younger, you're living a little bit more easy. And but then you need to be a little bit more modest in your 40s and 50s. You know, my experience all through my career is that as people's income rises, that magically their expenses, that they just manage to always spend more money and there's never any cushion, any room left for savings and investment if they haven't started it as a key habit, like getting out and exercising three times a week or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, you bring up this notion of having no cushion whatsoever. And so uh, essentially living paycheck to paycheck. And even economists would say that it's a good idea to have a rainy day savings fund. It is just a, a hard way to live, to really be running to zero in your checking account at the end of every month or every pay period. Uh, yeah, uh, even though economists would say that you don't need to save a lot uh, in your 20s, you should still make it a priority to have that savings cushion of, let's say, three months of income or six months of income. Now, your specialty, your field of being a behavioral economist was really looked at almost like as pseudo science initially, and now it's really emerged as the most powerful field in economics because you really look at how people behave rather than what they should do. And what areas do you see that uh, confound you, that, that shock you the most? how much we conspire against ourselves with how we handle money. Well, I think that one thing that uh, even kind of the uh, economic models that are most sympathetic to what consumers are doing, kind of assuming that if consumers are doing something, it must be for a good reason. Uh, even those economic models have a very hard time matching the high level of credit card borrowing that we see in our economy. So borrowing at 15%, 19%, 20%, that's another hard way to live. And the, the arithmetic of that is pretty grim. And so I think that that seems to be a fairly self-defeating behavior along with the living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, you know, the, the saying goes that for every person who is you know, struggling on $45,000 a year, there's somebody living down the street at $40,000 a year, perfectly okay. And so the notion that you can't put aside a few 
percent of your income, a uh, few percentage points of your income to create that cushion, I think that that's uh, probably a mistake. So I have a lot of people who, who say to me, well, who are younger, that why would I even bother? There's not even going to be Social Security by the time I retire and all that. And so they kind of uh, give up and just worry about today. How would you reinforce the message with people that really it is on me, myself, and I, that I'm the one who's got to build my financial security? Well, first of all, if you really do believe that there's going to be no Social Security when you retire, then it really it is on you because otherwise you're going to be out in the street uh, starving to death. Now, that being said, Americans are curiously pessimistic about Social Security. Even people who are just a few ways, a few years from starting to collect Social Security because they're older, a lot of those people think that Social Security is just not going to pay them a penny. And that, I think, is a completely misguided belief. You can look at, for example, uh, Greece that went through pretty much the worst economic crisis you can think of uh, in 2008, 2009, 2010. Even Greece did not get rid of their public pension scheme. So old people in Greece still got some benefit. They, I don't think they got the full amount promised, but they got something, uh, and, and not just pennies, but a significant amount. And so this notion that Social Security is going to disappear and pay me nothing, I think uh, that's a very hard belief to support. And I think there's just no political uh, possibility that that would actually happen, that you would actually see Social Security cut exactly to zero. I think what you are likely to see is some slowing in the growth of benefits of Social Security. And so it would be less generous by the time young people uh, reach retirement age than it is right now. But, uh, you know, I, I think that you can count on something being there. So that's kind of, you know, the, the, the first response I would give. Uh, second response is, uh, you know, uh, somehow you uh, are living life and you end up getting older. And uh, you might think, oh, there's no chance at all that I'm going to ever hit age 40 or age 50. But life happens. And, and here you are and here I am. And, um, yeah, uh, the, the rate at which people die in the United States before the age of 60 is pretty low. So you have a very good chance of making it to 60 or beyond. And so you just need to plan for that because uh, chances are you're going to be around and you're going to be reaping uh, what you sow or don't sow. So you led right into my last question for you. So if you were talking to a 20-year-old, not an economics student, uh, just a 20-year-old, what would you what would be the pep talk you'd give them about how you'd want them, based on your research and your experience, how you'd want them to handle money through their lifetime as they emerge as an adult in their 20s? I think the most important thing is to have a plan. So I don't know what's right for you. I don't know what your life circumstances are. It could be that you're getting married next year and it is totally worth it for you to splurge on a, a blowout wedding because that's going to be really special to you and your spouse and your family. Uh, or you know maybe there's nothing special happening next year for you and so it's, it's a better time for you to maybe put aside a few dollars. I don't know what's right for you, but I think you need to have a plan. And what I tell my students, and it's an exercise that we do in my class, is just to uh, put in a spreadsheet, how much do you think you're going to save every year from now until age 65. Now, of course, this isn't going to actually happen. Life has a lot of uncertainty, so you're not going to actually hit the target, but let's just kind of ballpark how much you think you're going to save each year. Let's just add that up, uh, assume a conservative rate of return, and then just see what's the arithmetic say. Are you going to end up with some amount of money, some amount of savings at age 65 that is reasonable? And if you're not even in the ballpark of reasonable under your assumed plan, then you need to change something because, uh, you know, and, and I, I'm not saying going to say that you need to save more today, but you need to have some plan that, you know, at this particular age, that's when I'm going to really change the trajectory of my savings. Well, Professor James Choi, thank you so much. And I'm just so impressed with the breakthroughs that the field of behavioral economics have brought to people around the world because it is such a different way of looking at things 
than the way the field of economics always did. And it's so much better a predictor about what actually happens with people. And I love it that you've dedicated your life's work to this study and this field. Yeah, it's been fun. And, and I always tell people when they ask me, what do you do? I say, I study dumb things people do with their money. And I there's a lot, that. lot to study there. That's right. Well, Professor James Choi, thank you. And you've been listening to the podcast, of Clark Howard podcast. And I appreciate so much you joining us. For more info for your wallet, check out Clark.com and ClarkDeals.com. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, that was fun. All right.